Welcome to The Positioning Show, where we discuss topics related to the practical application of positioning for marketing, sales, and product teams. I'm April Dunford, a consultant, author, and the world's leading expert on positioning for B2B technology companies. Hey, everybody. I am super excited today because we have a very special guest, and that guest is Matt Dixon. Now, a lot of you might know Matt Dixon from his groundbreaking book from 2010, 2011 called The Challenger Sale. That is a book that sold a million copies. It really changed the way we think about selling and sales. Today, I have Matt on the podcast to talk about his new book, The Jolt Effect. Now, The Jolt Effect is not a book about positioning, but for anybody that's struggling with taking your positioning and translating it into a sales narrative, I think The Jolt Effect is a super, super important book. In fact, The Jolt Effect is probably the book that I recommend the most when people are struggling with how do we do a better job of taking our positioning and making it really sing for the sales force. What I love the most about The Jolt Effect is that this is not like Matt's opinion about what works and doesn't work in a sales call. And let me tell you, the world is full of people with opinions about how that stuff works. Instead, this book is coming with the receipts. The book describes what Matt and his team learned from analyzing millions and millions of sales calls. The results of that analysis are nothing short of shocking. They discovered some things that were truly, truly surprising. Things that include one, how losing to no decision isn't actually a vote for the status quo. In fact, it's really more about customer indecision and what we should do to combat that. Secondly, this thing that we've been taught about how a sales rep shouldn't talk more than a customer in a sales call, their data actually shows that that has a negative impact on closing deals. But there's some caveats on there and some things that you really got to think about. Lastly, they discovered how dialing up the FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt in a sales call actually has a negative impact on win rates. Things like offering discounts, things like talking to our customer and saying, hey, you've got to do this because all of your competitors are doing this. This actually decreases the chance that you are actually going to close a deal. Now, you folks know that I'm working on a book about how to build a great sales pitch. What? You don't know that? You should know that. It's coming in October. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited about it. One of the things that's great is that I got the opportunity to talk to Matt and ask him some questions about how his research might impact the way that we look at building a really good sales narrative. And he had some really interesting things to say about that. I am super excited about this one. I hope you folks enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. April. Thanks for having me. It's so great to be with you. Oh, I'm so excited for this conversation because I'll tell you, I recommend your book probably more than any other book that I've read. Okay, I'll have to, I have to start paying you commission. Yeah, you then. should. Thank you. You should. <laughs> I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, but, you know, it's very like, nice of you. a buck a book or something, I'd be into a hundred bucks here. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I thought it was so fascinating, particularly because there's a lot of things that came out of that research that I thought that were really, really surprising. But just for folks, if for folks that maybe haven't read the book yet, can you describe a little bit of the background on what your goals were for the research and sure. how you actually conducted the research, just so people know where it came from? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we'd always been really interested in this problem, which I think has been a, a a problem that's gone on for a really long time, which is the no decision loss, which I think is the bane of every salesperson's existence. Um, especially when you get those customers, they say they're they say they're on board, they say they want to move forward, send me a proposal. You can, you know, you can stop selling me. I'm I'm, I'm sold. And then they kind of go into this wasteland of of no decision. And eventually uh, after a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and floating emails to the top of their inbox and trying to get back on the radar screen, you just kind of give up. Or more to the point, usually your manager tells you, okay, stop chasing garbage trucks. Let's mark it as closed, loss, no decision. But we never had a really good answer as to why. Um, so that was, was something we were kind of intellectually interested in. We had an opportunity to study it, though, in a very different way. So take us back um, in the time machine to March of 2020, which is a time I think we all remember with very mixed We're emotions, trying to forget, for sure. Matt, right? Matt, trying to forget, okay. right? <laughs> it was the, the time of sourdough bread, baking, right. and watching Tiger King and stuff like that, right? So this was a moment where I think uh, my co-author and I, Ted McKenna, we were working at a company called Tether, which is in the conversational intelligence space. Mm. So taking uh, call recordings, unstructured data, and, and surfacing insights using machine learning from that data. 
And it was in that moment that Ted and I kind of looked at each other and said, holy cow, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to study sales in a completely new way. Because the world of sales, as you recall, went from kind of hybrid. I think certainly early stage companies were were selling primarily on Zoom or Teams or whatever platform. Yeah. Uh, but if you across the world of sales, sales was on a slow march to becoming more virtual. So more of the sales process was occupied by Zoom in these virtual platforms, but still the really important meetings were happening face to face in the client's office on the, you know, at the conference, et cetera. And so you never really could study the entirety of a sales process until March of 2020, when mm. everybody in the world of B2B sales started doing all of their sales interactions, uh, the mundane ones, the demos, all the way to the closing calls and the discussions with procurement, the uh, leadership team buy-in meetings, the consensus building meetings, all these critical meetings were now happening on virtual platforms, which meant they could be recorded and studied using modern technology. So we recruited several dozen companies from across industry and asked those companies, would you, for the purposes of this study, send us all of your sales recordings? And it, it was over the period of about 18 months. Hmm. And we collected two and a half million sales calls, all told. Two and, and a half used, million. Um, That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot. Um, and so uh, fortunately, we had a machine to kind of listen to the scale. So we took all that unstructured audio, we transcribed it all, yep. and then we used our machine learning platform to study at scale. We looked at 8,300 variables in total, uh, built a large predictive model, and we were we targeted this at that question, why do we lose to no decision so often? And more importantly, what do the best salespeople do to avoid that outcome? Because it's so painful for everybody in sales and certainly for leaders. If you think about, hey, I'll share one data point. We found that anywhere from 40 to 60% of a salesperson's qualified pipeline will be lost ultimately to no decision. You multiply that across a team. So big. And it's just massive. Yeah. It's so big. I use that, I use that stat a lot in, you know, when I'm doing talks and I'm talking to my own clients. And and mm -hmm. people's minds are blown. Like they know they're losing a yeah. lot to no decision, but I don't think anybody has actually ever sat down and counted it. And then when you talk to to yeah. CEOs or heads of sales and you say, look, this data says 40 to 60% of the time you're losing to no decision, they go like this. Yeah, yeah, that's probably us too. Yeah, us too. <laughs> that's, us that's too. crazy. I'll tell you, there were there were people, you know, before I would say the book came out September of last year, and we were out at the Dreamforce conference um, yeah. uh, in San Francisco, and I remember talking to some companies, telling them about the new research, and uh, and yeah, a, a lot of people were interested, but there were a few people who were like, yeah, I don't think that happens to us very often. Almost every one of those people who told me that then called me back a couple months later and said, we did the math. And actually for us, it's like 70%, you know, so yeah, right. um, it's, you know, it's getting worse right before our eyes, just given the uncertain economy that we find ourselves in. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the quotes I really love in that book is this quote that says, customers are much less worried about missing out than messing up. So can you talk a yeah. bit about what you learned about customer indecision and what influences that? Yeah, that's that line, that one line um, you just quoted is the summary of the entire right. book. And I think there's a lot baked into that. So maybe let me um, rewind a little bit. So we actually um, found this surprising thing that uh, 40 to 60% of qualified opportunities will be lost to no decision, which as you said, some people are like, yeah, we think it's at least that if not higher. But a lot of people are surprised to know that the number is that big, but they start doing the math and the dollars add up, right? It becomes very cost a very costly problem. Yeah. So we looked into, you know, what do the best, what do salespeople tend to do in those situations? So if we think about a customer moving from their status quo to agreeing with your vision and what you propose to ultimately signing an agreement, where a lot of things, where things start to go sideways in sales is often between the point where the customer says they want to buy, but before the point where they actually buy. And it's that That's point where customers they start dredging up all the concerns and objections and you know the skepticism and the confusion the stuff that you thought you would had been asked and answered long ago and they start bringing it up again and salespeople feel it's that moment where you feel like oh this deal i already forecasted it for like next quarter it feels like it's slipping through my fingers i've got to do something or this will be lost to the wasteland of no decision i'll never hear from this customer again it's what most salespeople do in that moment is they go back because they've been taught to believe this that the customer is still wedded to their status quo. They believe that what they're doing today is yeah. good enough. What maybe what you're talking about is not a compelling enough reason to change, or this is just not a top priority uh, in their business. They have other other bigger fish to fry, other opportunities to get after. And so we tell salespeople go back and dial up the FOMO. You got to use a FOMO play to get the customer. I off hear the this fence. all gotta, the time. Like this is accepted. Yeah. This is accepted sales wisdom. 
Like it has been, it has been for a really long time. And, and you know, it's funny because I don't, some of the stuff and we'll get into it, but I, I don't know. People have asked me, is this a, is a new thing? Is this something? It's like that, that telescope, they put a million miles past the moon. That's now taking these pictures of the galaxy that have been there for billions of years. Right. We just never could see it before. Right. I think it's a combination. I think this is a secular trend where no decision losses are getting worse and what creates them is mm. getting worse. But I also think in some respects, we just didn't have the technology to find this. So we went right. with the conventional wisdom, which is we know People are lazy. They don't like to change. This is true of our customers, and it takes a lot to get them to change. I mean, we've all seen customers pass up on on better options standing right in front of them just so they can keep doing more of the same. It makes no logical sense whatsoever. Right. It's just the way we're wired as human beings. So we dial up the FOMO. Now, in sales, when we look at two and a half million sales calls, it, this plays out in one of three different ways. One, attempt number one is almost always... April, you must have missed how awesome our solution. You're going to miss out on all this goodness. Like, did you see these proof points? Maybe you didn't understand the value. They, Let's go back to the value. Did you see, right. Let's go back to the value. Do you see how many zeros were? Do you know, see where the decimal point was on right. that ROI calculation? Right, <laughs> like, right. It's big, you know? Yeah. Um, so play up the positive. The second one is always the FUD play. If that falls short, you go to FUD, right? Create the burning platform, make the customer squirm. You know, April, these problems that you've been lamenting for the past three months, we've been talking to, get, uh, to each other, they're not going to solve themselves. And did you know all of our competitors use yes. uh, our solution, or your competitors use our solution, and they're seeing tremendous benefits, and you're going to be left. Like that this one I hear all affairs. the time. This one all, where all the time, yeah. where people will say, like, this is what you got to do. You got to show, look, like you're missing out. All, your, comp- oh, all yeah. your competitors are doing it. If you don't do it, this is bad. But your research showed that that's actually not so good to do. It's not so great. In fact, I'd love to share with you just the third play, which is um, if those two don't work, it's always a scarcity play. And it almost right. is always the 10% discount that's only good this quarter, right? So that's <laughs> right. Like, like the last, it's like the Hail Mary pass, right? right? It's the end of the game. That's the last ditch yeah. attempt. But what we found to your point is that those attempts even though we've told salespeople, this is what you should do for a really long, really long time. We've been telling them this, we've been preaching this training, coaching to these um, techniques um, that they actually backfire more often than they work out. Um, for a customer who stated their intent to move forward, who then becomes hesitant, using that FOMO set of techniques increases the odds it'll, the deal will be lost to no decision. This was a total head scratcher to us and it, it because it flies in the face of, of the conventional sales wisdom. So we went back to the data and we tried to parse out why do no decision losses happen? So let's put aside the techniques salespeople use. And let's just ask the question, why do no decision losses happen? Why do customers end up in this place? And what we found is, simply put, there are two reasons. Now, salespeople have only ever been taught to recognize one, which is the customer believes that their status quo is good enough. What I'm doing today is good enough. What you're talking about is not a compelling enough reason to change. This is not a top priority. Those are status quo preference yeah. issues. But what we found is that that is one of two possible reasons. And it turns out it's the lesser of the two. The second reason, which nobody talks about, nobody's ever been taught to recognize, and is actually the bigger reason, is indecision that is stems from the customer's fear of failure. Now, what's interesting is you'll often hear people say, well, a no decision loss is a decision. The customer is deciding to stay with their status quo. That is true 44% of the time, but 56% of the time, The customer is stuck in a wasteland between intent and action. By definition, indecision is not a decision. It is somebody who has the intent to move forward but can't. And the thing that's holding them up is their fear of failure. Now, the second uh, wrinkle on this is that, and I hear this from salespeople all the time, they say to me, we sell to CFOs, we sell to GCs, we sell to CTOs, we sell to rational CEOs, maybe we sell to rational business leaders. They manage by their gut. They make they're paid to make the tough call. And you're telling me they're just scared of failing. How can that be? And it has to do with a really deep seated human bias, um, not the status quo bias. We're all familiar with that one. That's just basically people prefer to stay put and then rather than change. Right. We're familiar with that in sales. The one we're less familiar with is the omission bias. The omission bias holds that as human beings, when we think about loss, loss falls into two different categories. On the one hand, you've got loss that is the result of inaction. So you experience a loss, but it's a loss that you you experience because you chose not to act. You chose to sit on the sidelines, do nothing, and you experience a loss as a result. Hmm. That's different from an error of commission. An error of commission is when you make a decision, you choose a path of action, and that leads directly to a loss. So it is a loss for which you are personally responsible. Now, the the morbid, I would admit, but but popular um, psychological experiment that's often talked about to illustrate this is, imagine, April, you're standing on a train platform and you see a train heading down the tracks and somebody tells you that train is about to plow into a group of five people 
and it's going to kill all five of those people. However, April, there's a there's a lever on the platform, and if you pull that lever, it will send the train on a different track. But if it goes down that different track, it will kill two people. You'll oh, the man. five people won't die. But you will, so here's what happens: it doesn't make any rational sense. Rationally speaking, we should be more comfortable with two people dying as opposed to five, right? It's a morbid experiment, I admit. But what happens in psychological in experiments is that most people don't pull the lever because they would rather be indirectly responsible right. for five people dying than be directly responsible for two people dying. Oh That's called the omission bias. And what it comes down to is that line you said, people care a lot less about missing out. They are okay with losses that stem from doing nothing. They're not okay with losses that they are personally responsible for. They're not okay with messing up. So the shorthand is the FOMO matters less to your customers than the FOMU. Or I, some people have told me we should have called it the Fofu, but this is a family-friendly podcast, so we'll keep it, <laughs> keep it clean. <laughs> so. so what do we do? Like if, if customer yeah, indecision yeah. is the problem and, and, and folks are, you know, they've already said they want to buy something, but then they yep. get stuck in this loop of like, oh no, something bad might happen. Like what do we do in marketing and yeah. sales? Like, what, like what, yeah. what should salespeople do? What should companies be thinking about if they, they know they're losing all kinds of deals? Yeah, and that's what most of the book is about, um, is about this playbook we identified that high performers actually have figured out on their own. And this is the same kind of um, thing Neil Rackham learned when he wrote Spin Selling back yeah. in you know the 70s and 80s. And same thing we learned when we wrote The Challenger Sale is that when the buying environment changes, um, your top performers figure out a way to adapt. And they kind of figure out their own set of techniques. They don't wait to be trained or coached on. They certainly don't wait for sales books to be written to tell them to go do it. Yep. But top performers figure it out. It's called the lead steer effect. And so what we figured out many years ago um, is that by studying top performers, you get a, a window into what everybody should be doing. And it turns out top performers have a set of four techniques, which um, we we package into an acronym called the JOLT effect. JOLT is an acronym. It stands for four different behaviors. Judge the level of indecision, offer your recommendation, limit the exploration, and take risk off the table. Now, what I what I would tell you is, and we can we can talk about each of these, we can talk about any one. I'll let you I'll let you guide us here. But um, I would tell you if I were to summarize, what I would say is uh, what this tells us more than anything else. It's not that beating the status quo is unimportant in sales. It's not that those FOMO techniques are unimportant and, and not powerful. They are. But what great salespeople understand is that there are two battles that need to be won in a sale. The first one is to win the battle of overcoming customer indifference. That's about beating the status quo, yeah. showing them the pain of same, getting them to move forward, dialing up the FOMO. You got to do that. But when the customer agrees, I've got to leave the past behind. I've got to move forward. We've got to do something different. We want to work with you. They stop obsessing about whether to change, and then they start worrying about how to do so. And the things they start worrying about are things like, have I chosen the right configuration of this solution? You put a lot of options in front of me. I don't want to be choosing the wrong one. Or two, have I done enough research? This is a fast-moving space, and there's new information coming out all the time. Forrester Wave Reports, Gardner Magic Quadrants, no Analyst much. Opinions, so much. And I don't want to be in a position where some new piece of information comes to light later that I didn't uncover and it was my job to do the due diligence and now I've got egg on my face. Hmm. Or three, um, are we really going to get what we're paying for? And you know what's so interesting about that is that um, customers in these conversations, they rarely blame vendors. They don't tell vendors, I don't believe you on the ROI projection or I don't believe that reference customer you talked to me, I thought it was an actor you hired, or I don't believe <laughs> that case study or that proof point on your website. They believe you, but they often blame themselves and they'll say, you know, April, I get it. I get that most of your customers see these kinds of returns and these kinds of benefits, and, and you got some big fans out there. It's amazing. But you don't understand how dysfunctional we are here. Right. We will screw this up every right. day of the week and twice on Sunday. Right. And I cannot have my name associated with something that goes sideways, especially in this environment. That's not just looking like you have an egg on your face. I could get fired, right? Yeah. And so these are the things that tend to keep people from moving forward. So you need as a salesperson to shift from you know, overcoming indifference to then overcoming indecision. Right. You got to beat the status quo, but then you got to figuratively put your arm around the customer's shoulders and instill the confidence that they're making a great decision. They're working with a trusted advisor who's got their best interests in mind yeah. and knows a lot more than you do about the, what to do and what not to do here. And I've got your back. You're not going to look like a fool. You're going to look like a hero. And here's how I know that's going to be the case. And that's all about 
you know, instilling that confidence and getting our customer to move forward. So the jolt effect, those four behaviors, which again, we can talk about in some more detail because there's interesting ahas in each one of those. There's so um, many things the like, it, like in each of those things, there were so many things that I was kind of like, the first time I read your book, I was sitting on an airplane and there were a handful of things that I read it and I went, oh, and it was one of those moments where I was like, <laughs> I want to like jab the guy beside me and go, do you know <laughs> that salespeople should be talking more than the customer? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like there were a handful of things like that that I was like, whoa, I can't believe it. But I want to dig into a few things. Like, so sure. one, um, this idea that deals are more likely to close where a rep uh, specifically offers a recommendation. Yeah. Like yeah. that one, I've seen pushback against that with mm. this idea like the customer knows best, the customer right. should be able to make up their own mind on this, like we don't want to be pushy salespeople. Like what yep. did your research tell you about this recommending a specific solution to a customer? Yeah, so our research showed pretty clearly that, um, so what most salespeople do, and I think it comes from that uh, belief that customer's always right, but also what yep. we've been taught, which is um, you've got to diagnose the customer's needs. You got to find out what's keeping them up at night. Right. Um, now, when the customer starts to struggle with, boy, April, you showed me a lot. You showed me different use cases. You showed me different configurations. You showed me, talked about different contract lengths and ways to deploy your solution. You yeah. showed me a whole partner ecosystem. You gave me different options on rollout with professional services versus DIY. Like, there's, there's a lot you showed me. Help me out. And then they, they have that deer in the headlights moment because in a world where everything looks good, um, and you can't tell the difference and you're not sure which path to pick, the safest course of action is to choose none of them exactly. and to just sit on the sidelines. And so when the customer's looking for help, what most salespeople do is they go back to to their needs diagnosis skills because they don't want to be pushy and they don't want to be presumptuous and their hearts are in the right place. And so they go back to the customer and say, you know, let's talk about what's really important to you. Let's talk about why you first stopped by our trade show booth and, or you first picked, you know, filled out that demo request form. What was it that really caught your attention? And what they're hoping is the customer will figure out on their own which configuration is best for their needs. But I think what great salespeople understand is there's a time for asking and letting a thousand flowers bloom. And then there's a time to advise and direct the customer towards right. a narrower set of options and then firmly and personally recommending a specific course of action. So um, this is interesting. A, a lay person's... Um, ex by the way, and I know we've got a lot of uh, marketers, you know, product marketers. We got a lot of folks who are working above the funnel too in, in um, yep. awareness building and in, in demand gen. What I'm not suggesting is that we should not offer options to our customers. In fact, the, the social science around this is pretty clear that offering lots of options to people is a double-edged sword. Um, it is very good in terms of generating interest, right? So the famous jelly experiment that we talk about, which yep. Barry Schwartz writes about in his book, The Paradox of Choice. When you put a lot of jelly, flavors of jelly on a table, that the experiment was 24 flavors of jelly, you get a lot of people stopping by the table to try a sample, to try a flavor. But the problem is very few of them actually pick something and check out and take it home. Hmm. But if you ran a different experiment, which these psychologists did, they put six flavors on the table and they found that actually didn't drive as much foot traffic to the table. Not as many people, call, it didn't catch as much attention. It didn't create as much buzz. There weren't as many leads, but a huge chunk of the people who stopped by the table bought something and left with it. So what that tells you is that for marketing, in early stage, you know, or if you will, like early sales conversations at the trade show on the trade show floor, let a thousand flowers bloom. Yep. Our customers love the idea of the art of the possible, right? And, and that the solution is eminently configurable. But if you want your customer to pick something and actually buy something, you got to go from a thousand flowers blooming to getting the weed whacker out and then saying, right. forget about this stuff. Right. This is not right for now. Here's what you should think about. And I would do this. And here is why. And so great salespeople shift gears from asking to actually telling or recommending um, at a certain point in the sale. And that's usually about the midpoint where mm. you've thrown a lot at the customer and now you got to go from the art of the possible to like actually a proposal, right? That, that somebody could, uh, could sign off on. Hmm. You know, this kind of, this kind of leads into this other thing that I thought was really surprising in, in your work. Like uh, there was a section of the book that talked about um, that, trying to show the customer that they could achieve this maximal impact yeah. was actually yeah. not such a good thing. And it was more successfully, it was more successful if the reps were more realistic about the impact. Yes. And in fact, even maybe underselling the impact a little bit, that was super surprising to me. Yeah. Actually, statistically, that was the most impactful driver in the entire analysis That's um, we looked at. You know, so this falls in that category on the, on the T, taking risk off the table. Um, you know, it's funny because 
a lot of people want to go immediately to what are the safety net options, the confidence givers. But right. we often say is that the seeds of that hand wringing that happened really late about like, oh my goodness, I'm going to about to put my name on a proposal or in a contract that has an ROI attached to it that I know we're never going to attain. That the seeds of that feeling are planted very early in the sale when you let your customer get anchored on outlandish or gaudy ROI projections. Now, hmm. again, that stuff is great for marketing. It's great for you know your your PR campaigns. It's awesome to attract buzz and awareness. It's great on the you know when you're speaking from the main stage at the conference. Yep. That's really cool. Showcase that stuff, right? Case studies and proof points and success stories. You want to showcase those those maximum impact stories. But what we found is that um, when a lot of times those will attract attention. The customer comes to you and says, wow, 500x ROI or wow, million dollar cost savings or wow, like 20x improvement in sales productivity from your solution. Like that sounds great. Your average salesperson is thinking, if you're excited by that, I'm not going to talk you out of it and I'll let you run with right. it. But again, that's the same customer who later on put their name on a business case in front of the CFO, badge on the table. We're going to get a 10x improvement in sales productivity from the solution. And now their hand is hovering over the contract thinking, my name is attached to this, and I know deep down that's going to be really hard to achieve. So what great salespeople do is they underpromise and they overdeliver. So they will say up front, and it's not that they disavow those proof points. Right. They're not going to say, oh, that, that's actually a bunch of hogwash, of course. Say, look, absolutely, that is possible. But what you need to understand is that case study you're referencing, um, that company had total planetary alignment. They resourced it to the hilt. Everything went right. There was perfect symbiosis. Everyone was bought in and on board. There were no roadblocks. We know that doesn't it doesn't always happen that way with, with software rollouts or with technology rollouts. So what I would recommend is, while that is possible, a 10x improvement in sales productivity, I would recommend that we build the business case around a 5x improvement. And here's why: we see that in 95% of our implementations, and so I'm highly confident we are at least going to see that. And I know your CFO is going to be thrilled with an investment that get, generates a 5x improvement in sales productivity. And here's the thing. I'm very confident we're going to overperform, and then it's going to set you up for success. What I don't want to have happen is that you're, you put your name on a really high projection where we need everything to go perfectly, and then you're sweating that immediately. And at the first sign where things slip or we might get a little bit off track, you're you're worried, right? And you're feeling undue pressure. Let's set yeah. the bar at the right level, and then let's overperform. Hmm. I love it. This piece I think is really interesting. It, the other one, the, the other thing that, you know, when I was reading and I wanted to jab my elbow into the guy sitting beside me on the plane was uh, the the stat talking about reps talking more or oh, less yeah. than yeah. customers on calls. Like yeah. it, it is considered standard wisdom that the customer right. should be doing the vast majority of the talking and the reps should be doing very little talking on a sales yeah. call and and your research kind of debunked that. Yeah, we we actually found so there's and I know I've I've read a lot of that uh content on LinkedIn um uh that you know best best reps talk only, you know, 30 Where did that of the come time. from? Do you have any idea where that came from? Um I've I won't name names but I oh. but it is part of the it becomes this some of the stuff in the done in the vein of thought leadership, which is not sort of uh kind of confuses causation and correlation oh, a little right. bit. And I think the the proper question to be asking is what are the reps saying? And if the reps are offering value, which high performers do, then customers want to hear from the reps. If you are a subject right. matter expert, if you are deep on your solution, right. if you are providing great guidance to your customer, then absolutely. In fact, what that is what we find is that high performers actually talk more than um, uh, than average performers. But it's what they're saying. It's not really how much they're saying. The other interesting wrinkle about this, uh, April, is you may remember that that finding that uh, high performers actually interrupt customers more than average performers. That was that, the, that was one, the other one that I was like, what? yeah. <laughs> well, we've always. Do you know what's funny? Taught, I like, actually, I, yeah. I went, I went and had a beer with a friend of mine who's oh. who's vice president of sales, and I said, "Have you read this book, Jolt Effect?" He said, "Oh yeah, I read it too." So we were having a conversation <laughs> about it. And I and he said, you know what the one that, that I said, I knew it the minute I read it was that one where he said the reps are in, interrupting the customer. He yeah, says, he says, good yeah. reps do that all the time. I so it's so interesting. Um, and, and you know, interruption is probably a uh, misnomer here because, right. as you know, we talk about it when you measure it in conversation. You look at the audio; it comes across as uh, as an interruption or be categorized as such. But when you actually go back and listen to it, it's it's what we're doing on this conversation. It's not interruption in a rude way, which all of our parents told us not to do because it's rude. It's cooperative overlapping. It's the same way you would engage with a good friend 
or probably with that colleague that you had a beer with, where you know you're finishing each other's sentences, you're jumping in, you're and it's an active, right. engaged conversation. And again, it's the substance of what's happening there. But I think the big takeaway here is when you're delivering value and um, and when you when you are dialed into the conversation. It is a lot of overlapping. Uh, there is a lot of talking that happens on the part of the rep. Yep. It is a fundamentally different kind of conversation. You know, it's funny because we talked about the amount of talk time. You know what the, one of the biggest negatives was, was silence time, uh, which, which is funny because a lot of salespeople have been taught, you know, the, the pregnant pause, like don't, don't speak first, let the customer go. But that actually was one of the biggest uh, killers because it signals the customer that you're kind of having this deer in the headlights moment. You actually don't know what the answer is or you don't know what to say. So they want a salesperson who's fully engaged. Now, what I wouldn't tell salespeople is, again, in the causation correlation thing is that just by talking over your customer or doing cooperative overlapping and interrupting and talking more than they do, you will sell more. Because again, it matters what you're saying. Exactly. <laughs> that, uh, exactly. Right. That's the key. I think, I think maybe that's where this weird advice comes from, right? Because it's, it's the nuance in this advice that actually yeah. makes a big difference. Like we can't just go right. out there and tell our reps like, hey, just talk all the time. Don't let the other guy say anything. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, be careful. Yeah, <laughs> Care, careful with that You're one. Like, right? yeah, so. no, not exactly that. I want to talk a little bit about discounts and limited time offers. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so what did your research say about discounts and limited time offers? Because a lot of the companies I've worked with, they love the idea of discounts, uh, and the reps yeah. in particular love the idea of discounts. So, most of the time when I've been working with sales and we've been dealing with pricing things, the reps really want to be able to offer a discount because they feel yeah. like it's really. Uh, a, a closing tool that works? Like, what does your research say about that? You know, um, I remember having this uh, debate with our, back when, um, uh, several companies ago, um, we we had permissioned our salespeople. And it was one of these things that our salespeople gave away like candy, which was the 10% discount yeah. uh, to motivate the close, create, you know, create the urgency driver, create the scarcity, et cetera. Yeah. And despite all the data showing that best reps don't use that, and there was no causation, if you will, around close rates. We could never get the sales sales leadership to agree to um, hold price, right? Yeah. I think one of the one of the smartest thing I've, things I've heard say, said about discounts, temporary discounts, is that in the you might think it's temporary, but in the eyes of the customer, you've just reset the price. It's permanent. So they, hmm. if you've reset the price, your customer now knows you're, where you're willing to go. And it also can be a dangerous thing, um, which could signal to your customer that you were inflating the price before. So if that's where you're willing to go, then you were willing to overcharge me before. Yeah. So I, I've always found this to be a, a dangerous thing. Now, I, uh, the, but w in keeping with the, the research, I think that is in that category of these FOMO plays, right? These FOMO techniques designed yeah. to create urgency, scarcity, you know, force the customer, create that FOMO, force the customer into action. And the reason it backfires, whether it's that or it's dialing up the FUD or just even re-articulating the value of the solution, is because you're trying to use scare tactics to sell to somebody who's already afraid. But they're not afraid of the thing you think point. you're afraid of. They're not, they're not afraid of missing out. They're afraid of messing up. And so they don't need you. So when you do that, all you're doing is now giving them more to be afraid of. So I was worried that we weren't going to get the ROI. I was worried that maybe the configuration we chose is not the right one for us. And now on top of that, you're telling me that I can, like this price is going to disappear next week and I've got to buy now. Now I'm just frozen, right? I, I am in, I am absolutely not doing anything. So that's, I think what I would encourage people to think about is, um, and it's not to say that discounting when used the right way can't be an effective tool. I don't want to rule it out unilaterally. I just think there's good reason to be skeptical of the effectiveness of that and uh, the negative impact that it can drive with the customer um, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the urgency and the positive outcomes that we can get as salespeople. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I got kind of a last question, which is sure. um, I was thinking about, you know, as, as I come from product marketing, from the product marketing yep. side of the house, and one of the things product marketers do, you know, aside from positioning is they're often working on first call decks with Mm -hmm. with uh, with the sales team. So is there anything that you would recommend specifically around first call deck? Like does, does, yeah, the, yeah. does the first call deck look different knowing what we know from this research? So you know what? I, I actually would steer people to the earlier work around uh, the challenger sale and the challenger customer, which yeah. challenger sale came out in 2011, challenger customer came out in 2015. In those two books, we talk about exactly that question, which is um, how do you create an insight-led 
uh, first sales call deck. Yeah. Now, what you I think what you'll find is that, and you've probably seen this movie before, but almost every first call deck I've ever seen starts with the same first four slides. The first one is your mission and values as a company. Right. Uh, the second one is uh, your your logos of your products and solutions that you're well known for. The third one is your brag sheet of customers that you work with. Uh, and the fourth one is usually like a map of the world with some dots on it to show how many offices you have. You right. know? And And it's not to say that those things are unimportant, but they're arguably not they well I would say they're almost certainly not differentiators um and they don't really answer the fundamental question which is why should the customer buy from you instead of your competitors and it's not because you've got a great list of companies you work with it's not because your mission and values are great it's not because you have well known products it's not because you have a lot of offices or have won a lot of awards what is the thing that you do or your solution does that is unique and and solves a problem that your competitors can't and the story you want to tell has to create that problem for the customer. You got to bring that new idea to the table in a way that leads to your solution. Yep. You got to give them a reason to want to pay for that differentiator. And it's not to say you're going to get rid of all that stuff that, you know, the warm and fuzzy, like here's how old we are, here's how many awards we won, here's how great we are, here's how fast we've been growing, here's all the great companies we work with. That's all fine. But it absolutely should not go in the beginning of your uh, pitch deck. That's leading with what you think makes you unique, not leading to what makes you unique. Yeah. And so in the Challenger sale, we walk through the Granger story, which many people know. It's a great example of a company that literally flipped its sales pitch on its ear from lead with to lead to. And then the Challenger customer, we offer a whole bunch of other case studies of companies that do have done that successfully. So for uh, for product marketers who are charged with that uh, that task, which is is a big task. Um, I would recommend those two books as as a starting point. Um, I would say though, in, with respect to the Jolt effect, I do think that we as salespeople um, in those early, very early meetings, those very first interactions, I think we can start detecting, you know, we didn't talk about the J, judging the level of indecision, but starting to mm. detect using our active listening, some sense and respond techniques we talk about in the book to actually surface the customer's personal level of decisiveness or indecisiveness what about this purchase itself is going to get us wrapped around the axle? And then are there environmental factors going on? Maybe it's the economy. It might also be the climate in your, your company. You just had a leadership change or yeah. uh, your boss just got fired or you just had an M&A event and you're doing integration. Like There are things going on that might take somebody who's normally decisive and make them highly indecisive. And so we can start detecting that stuff in the very, very first meeting. We shouldn't wait until the deal is stalled to start thinking about um, indecision. We always say this, like the Jolt playbook is not a closing playbook. It is something that best people, best salespeople will deploy very, very early on, as early as the first uh, first sales meeting. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, your company, DCM Insights, yep. uh, helps organizations with this stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about the kinds of projects you work on and what kind of companies you work with? And, and yeah, you know, maybe absolutely. you want to talk about like if anybody listening to this show wants to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Sure. I actually a great way to get in touch with me is on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so if you heard me on the show, uh, shoot me a note, uh, let me know, um, and uh, and let's be connected. And if you have any follow up questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Awesome. If you want to learn more about our company, it's at we're at dcminsights.com. Um, we've got a whole site around the Jolt Effect called JoltEffect.com that has a lot of free resources, actually tools and templates and some some different coaching um, uh, resources you can download. It's also got a self-paced learning journey you can sign up for or, or bring your team through if you want to get the full eight, 10 hour training program and certification. So there's a lot of there's a lot of content there. You know, our company is um, we're a, a research based company, but we're also trying to take the insights like Jolt Effect and help companies um, get value out of those insights through training and coaching and enablement. And so we've got part of our company that focuses on B2B sales. Uh, Jolt Effect is a good example of some of our work. And then we've got another part of our company that actually focuses on professional services selling, which as we talked about earlier, April, yeah. they don't really use the word sales. It's more of a four-letter word in law firms, accounting firms, investment banks, right. and consulting firms. But partners in those firms are doer sellers. They've got to sell the work and deliver the work. It's a unique sales world. And so we've just completed some new research in that area about what top rainmakers do in professional services. And we have a whole training program around that. So if you happen to be listening and you're in that space uh, and you want to learn more, just just hit me up and I'd be happy to, happy to share with you. Awesome. All right. Well, that's it. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, April. It's been great. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for the invite.